Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the to this uh, webinar on how to engage non-academic publics uh, in research results. My name is Cristina Ponte. I am professor at Universidade Nova, Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, in the Y Skills project, I am coordinating the working package on um, communication, dissemination, and exploitation activities. Uh, for sure, uh, academics are uh, key audiences for academics, and namely for research results and scientific publications. Uh, we uh, are very keen that we have to uh, disseminate our research results in scientific uh, publications, but uh, when we thought um, uh, how to organize uh, a webinar focused on uh, communication, dissemination and exploitation. Rita, my colleague, from also from Portugal, and I, we thought that uh, it would be a challenge to think about non-academic audiences uh, and we invited uh, people that, are, uh, that have precisely this kind of experience. Uh, and I'm, uh, we are very proud to introduce you our um, um, speakers, Atina, Karatzo Yanni, uh, Veronica Donoso and Elizabeth Milovidov. Um, you see they, they came from different areas. Um, so um, we, uh, we um, put a focus on this engagement um that uh, wants to um, explore and interact with non-academic publics we consider that uh, uh, this webinar could be one hour long and if you have uh, some questions uh, and uh, uh, some comments please put them on the on the chat that is open um and uh, um we uh, we as you know also our uh, Y Skills webinars are recorded uh, for research and ed educational purposes. They are um, available on the Y Skills um, channel um, and on the social platforms and websites. So this is a, a resource that uh, has a longer life than the um, direct uh, than the online time that co uh, coincides with the moment of um, the the presentation and uh, this is very good um we um as probably um you know that um, this uh, project why skills is uh, funded by the horizon 2020 project and uh, it aims to explore and to research how to maximize the long-term positive uh, impacts of white skills, uh, of digital skills uh, on multiple aspects of well-being for all children. Here in the White Skills Project, we put a special focus on adolescents and uh, we uh, are conducting different uh, kind of uh, studies and um, qualitative research to know more about this relation uh, between adolescents and digital skills. We disseminate our research results on the website, on social media, through the newsletter, um, through infographics that are produced in different national languages. We want, uh, we really want to reach um, a larger audience uh, besides the English, uh, the English one, let's say. Um, and for the our purpose we also want to co-create research results and research tools uh, with uh, our different targets which are namely adolescents themselves and uh, mediators where we include teachers and educators health professionals digital producers industries policy makers and so, and so on so um for the first presentation, uh, we are very proud uh, um, on having on the, not on the floor, but on the screen, Atina. Atina um, is, um, uh, will uh, comment, will uh, present her research uh, uh, related with a very um, 
recent project that was also founded by to Horizon 2020 and a project that is a sister project uh, of the Y Skills. Atina is professor in media and communication at the University of Western. She was principal investigator of this project, DigiGen, uh, which uh, had a subtitle, The Impact of Technological Transformations on the Digital Generations. Um, in this project, uh, she led uh, the work on ICT and the transformation of civic participation. Um, and uh, her research has focused on the intersections between digital media theory, resistance networks and global politics, uh, investigating ICT use by social movements and protest groups. Uh, as you can see, um, she will, uh, Atina, she will introduce us uh, with the, the challenges and the opportunities provided by active methods of engaging uh, um, young people. So, Atina, uh, the floor, the screen is yours. And um, please, please uh, go. Thank on. you. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful introduction and for inviting me. Um, to present my uh, my my work and and having said that it is not uh, just my work it involves uh, roughly about twenty different people in three countries uh, so I represent uh, quite a big uh, group group of people actually uh, now since I have uh, uh, only twelve minutes I'm told um, why I think uh, this uh, this research what I th uh, whom uh, it might interest and might be relevant to, there's uh, several um, uh, stakeholders. Um, first of all, adolescents and young people themselves, obviously, and those that uh, are interested uh, in civic participation and using digital technologies for uh, social change, uh, policymakers um, uh, in different parts of uh, policy making, uh, for example, uh, here in the UK, uh, DCMS, the Digital Cultural Media and Sport Ministry, is is interested, uh, and they we I consulted uh, with them as an expert uh, on um, uh, particularly on online harms, uh, for instance. Then you have educators uh, as part of the DigiGen, uh, uh, the Paderborn team in Germany uh, led a package on education, for instance, and and skills in schools. Uh, and then you have parents and family, uh, our colleague uh, Olaf Capella in, in, um, in Vienna uh, worked on this and one of the few projects, I don't even know if there's another one between children between five and 10, for example. So parents and families are, are important and there are, um, it's possible that parents and families are interested to see how um, the, the, the children develop in, in this area, the civic participation from a young age. Uh, because we, we become political <laughs> from a very young age. Um, and then you have broader uh, stakeholders in civil society, of course, uh, but also, also industry partners, uh, especially because uh, if you look at game um, gaming, uh, for instance, how um, young people and children in particular um, socialize through gaming, uh, it creates uh, expectations about roles, about uh, uh, how we engage online and so on. So they're important players, uh, for instance, industry players, uh, not to mention uh, the engagement we had with Veronica in the steering group for the youth digital citizenship group uh, uh, that was that's coordinated by meta, meta platforms where here, there you have a, a whole other thing going on we don't have a lot of time for. But in terms of um, the focus that, that is relevant to um, civic participation, how what kind of competencies and skills can we uh, develop uh, to support uh, individuals, future citizens, right, in particular the Generation Z, right, with, with civic ethical skills to contribute into different parts of, of society and to actively participate in the democratic process, right? So in as part of the DigiGen uh, uh, um, impact uh, policy and engaging a non-academic audiences, uh, the project developed a toolkit uh, which is uh, both an actual uh, uh, object uh, that has many, many cards um, uh, that, that makes uh, uh, children between nine and 15 and their parents and educators uh, engage with questions 
um, uh, around uh, ICT, uh, in, uh, in laser, in civic participation, in family, and so on. And also, this can be found online, and, and I can share inside this chat uh, that link. And for that toolkit to be developed, the young people were um, actually consulted, and not only our our fundings were in, uh, um, we inputted, we we included and sent insights from the actual research to the toolkit, but also young people were consulted in the creation of of, of this toolkit as well. So, uh, and and in that sense, then. What I would like to talk about in the remaining time I have is that in, in the ICT and civic participation uh, package that we led from the University of Leicester uh, uh, with uh, coordination with Estonia and Greece, we have three phases. The first phase is we did uh, an ethnography, an aligned image and con content and observation, uh, and each country uh, focused on dominant um, um, political, the dominant political engagement during the pandemic, because the research uh, happened du during the pandemic. And then the second phase, we we, we co-researched with young people uh, in each country, uh, and they created uh, three to five minute uh, videos about what inspires and challenges the, the civic participation. And the, in the third phase, we looked at uh, something like, I think 44 documents in total from the three countries that related to, 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 to civic participation. Now, in terms of an example of uh, research that we um, uh, we related, we, we in, tried to inject into the toolkit that was developed uh, for dissemination I, I mentioned before, uh, I want to give an example uh, of this report uh, that we did on uh, where we used um, these are storytelling workshops and how we did that um, is we invited, we had the protocol and uh, we invited, it was a two hour uh, online workshop uh, on Zoom and we recorded that. We invited um, adolescents uh, from the three countries. So this happened separately in the three countries. We invited them, there was a protocol where they would, uh, uh, um, uh, we implemented uh, the same in each country, and we had um, uh, just to show, uh, you know, how, how we did that in terms of, it might be too small the letters, but the idea is that we introduce uh, what we're trying to do, they were then invited to think about uh, a story they were, they were to share, then we trained them to use, uh, in, in some cases, with PowerPoint uh, to, to create, to collect images online and bring them back to it. And then we and then they created their own story on PowerPoint and then they share with this, each other and then they explain why they chose that story. More or less, I'm just explaining the, the protocol. Now, I want to show you a specific example from a participant. Uh, I, I didn't want to actually show a video because that would be showing the participant participant uh, space. Uh, but uh, here is a quote that I think is very interesting. Um, this uh, involved uh, the killing of a young person in Ireland. And this participant felt uh, that they had to go online uh, because they thought there was uh, misinformation about the murder of, of this young person and about uh, uh, the protest that occurred afterwards. Um, and they, the, they, they, the participation was triggered by the injustice they felt um, uh, that was involved in the killing by uh, of um, uh, this person George Chenko from uh, by the police in Ireland. So is this in, in injustice and racism that they they felt they had to say something about and they went online and engaged with that? Um, the the uh, second is about anti, anti police brutality protests in Nigeria. Uh, I'm giving a, a UK examples because it's the ones that I was mo mostly engaged with. Um, and it's about the movement and SARS. And here the key is that the participant felt that in the UK, the British media did not cover uh, anything to do with this uh, protest in Nigeria. And they had to go by themselves and find out more information, being a diaspora um, a, a person. And, and they got involved in diaspora protests in London as well. Um, and they said, that, how can I, I feel that I don't have a voice to, to engage um, in situations in countries that are not of interest, you know, in, in the country that I'm, I am now. Um, so uh, to finish with, uh, I think that 
the word challenges in coordinating uh, this, these workshops and recruiting adolescents at the time uh, where everybody was really busy, including the parents and the teachers. So we had to make a big effort to try and get this, to get these two hours with the young people together to, to talk to them. Um, and what we found in the, sec in the second phase confirmed what we found in the first phase, actually to a great extent that the Estonian um, adolescents uh, were complaining about maybe the time uh, that they are fearful or they don't have enough time to participate and um, you know, but they're interested in issues of inequality, especially uh, uh, social and uh, racial justice and so on. Uh, but they are, I mean, in the way they're comfortable in, in their use of digital technology um, uh, and, and they don't seem to have a lot of issues except, you know, this fear or confidence or I need more time to engage and so on. However, in the UK and, and Greece, where it is, the, the context is very polarized, it's a pol they're polarized in terms of um, of the, the Grexit and the Brexit, uh, you know, if you know what I'm talking about, and you have adolescents that worry about policing, about misinformation, about both about their own governments, but also by um, their media, uh, the media system uh, in, in, in those countries, right? So, um, uh, this is uh, from me. I hope I didn't take uh, more time than I was allowed there. And uh, looking forward to the next presentations. Thank you. Christina, sorry, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Etina. Uh, I was mute. Uh, thank you for your presentation. We have time, I'm sure, for uh, uh, more uh, um, comments about your um, uh, presentation that provide excellent examples of tools uh, for engagement and the results of um, these um, uh, productions um, that uh, show um, the involvement, the engagement of uh, young people in three countries. So uh, the next um, the next um, presenter is Veronica. Uh, I uh, Veronica is um, a researcher from the Catholic University of Leuven, Veronica Donoso, and she is the digital literacy and child online safety advisor for the European School Net. Uh, as we know, the school net, the European school net is a network of 34 European ministries of education and that aims to bring innovation in teaching and learning. Veronica has advised several organizations, including the UN, the European Commission, the UNICEF. And uh, in the last years, uh, Veronica has been responsible for the educational toolkit um, and um, uh, of this project, the core project, the Children Online Research and Evidence Project, which is also um, a, a Horizon 2020 funded project, and it's a platform of resources. Um, and uh, the title of uh, the title of our presentation makes um, the point of uh, the experience that uh, Veronica has uh, lived. Um, in uh, this challenge of uh, trying to bring research closer to education stakeholders. So, Veronica, the screen is yours. Thank you, Cristina, for the, the nice introduction. And, and thank you all for being here uh, today. Um, as um, Cristina said, I'm, I'm, I represent today the, the core project. Uh, we are a consortium of 10 different um, members and uh, for mainly academics and European school nets. Um, and what the core project is a bit different. It's not in itself a research project, but it's actually a project that aimed during three years. This is the last year. Actually, we are in the last weeks of the project. We try to develop a knowledge base that brings together uh, the research and the evidence we know about children and digital technologies. The idea was to bring all this knowledge together in a kind of like a one-stop shop where, where anybody interested in the topic uh, would come and find um, information that is relevant for them. Now, um, one of the 
issues that was at the core of our project was engaging with our stakeholders because um, on the one hand, we develop a knowledge base that is uh, targeting uh, researchers. So researchers can go there and search uh, articles uh, by country, by um, by year, by uh, by topic of interest. But we also um, were very concerned in our project that the, the research that is out there, and this is um, only about um, research in Europe, it's so, it's so, it's so relevant uh, that it would be a pity just to keep it for the academic community. So we, we, we struggled like uh, for a long time to think how do we engage with, with, stake, with our stakeholders beyond the academia. So we have two different work packages, one dealing with engagement of, of all types of stakeholders. And today I'm gonna to be talking about a specific work package that was about how do we bring research in general. So all the research, the thousands of pieces of research that we have gathered in this platform closer to them, to educators. So um, what, um, the, the, that's so you have an idea of the project consortium it's 10 countries um 10 different academic partners and every in every part in every country we had um each of these countries we had one academic partner that was in charge of um uh, advising us on to what was the recent research in their country what research to include in our database and making uh, sure that this research were well annotated so that then they could be easily found. But as I said, um, one of the biggest challenges in our project was, yeah, well, we have uh, thousands of uh, um, academic articles here, but if we want to have an impact and if we want to make a difference, we want this research to reach other people. And the challenge we have, it's pretty much is a challenge of science communication. So how can we make this research useful, but in a way also that it's manageable by the the resources we have, we have a limited team, limited time, limited money to do what we do. So the big questions for us was, okay, we, it felt like we are trying to build a bridge here. We on the one side have a lot of research and on the other hand, in our work package, we have educators. Now, who are these educators? And, and in our, um, we, we, we did actually a, a very, big exercise to even try to define our target group with our own stakeholders. So in the end, we end up with a definition of educators that is quite broad, and we included everybody that actually has to do with children's education. And that could be a teacher, it could be someone working at a school, but it can also be um, organizations like a Safer Internet Center who usually produce materials for teachers. So uh, in the end, they will have an impact on children. Um, but not children themselves. So we are not targeting with this toolkit. It's not something that children are gonna use. It's not something that parents are going to use, but we decided that actually what we want is people who are gonna be developing things or teaching things or educating children. So we also consider policymakers because obviously the decisions they make have an impact on children. So what was more or less of our approach? And if you look at the blue boxes, that's basically how we started with, with it. We thought, yeah, we need to engage with our stakeholders if we want to understand and to develop at the end of this project something that is meaningful for them. And we thought that was a key word, like being meaningful, being relevant, being user-centric, and, and basically trying to understand what they need. And that's how this all started. So we came up with the idea of having consultations and by consultations we had different types of meetings brainstorming sessions we gather formally more informally with different types of people from academics from youngsters themselves with teachers with policy makers uh, in the different years of our project and we also um, organized some co-creation sessions where we brainstormed together on what would be like the ideal toolkit I mean of course that they came up with great ideas that we couldn't implement on this project, but who knows, maybe those ideas and we would like to bring them together for next stages or for potentially uh, future projects. Um, now, why were this <clears throat> important? Um, this, this working uh, with the stakeholders because it helped us identify requirements. And, and what I mean by this is that it helped us to understand what our stakeholders needed, what they wanted to see, what they found important, and it also helped us to redefine our own target group. So in the beginning, we were thinking about parents, about children, and in the end, we end up 
trying to understand what actually what we need is that to convince and to persuade people who are working in education to use more research. So that's basically what we want. And um, with all the, the feedback that, that we, uh, we got, then we went to a process where we kind of um, translated or we tried to translate all this input from these uh, first years of the project into something concrete. And the something concrete became two things actually, not just an education toolkit, um, which I will explain more at the end, uh, but also guidelines for the academic community, because we realize this cannot be just a top-down approach. It cannot be that we just academics develop something for the people out there. We also need to then, with all the knowledge that we gather, we need to put it together and tell academics, look, this is what stakeholders need from us when we engage in research. So that, that's why we ended up using developing this toolkit, but also the academics for, for the um, guidelines for academics, so that we as academics are also a bit more aware whenever we develop research of how we can get closer to the people we work with. So this is just an example of consultations, of quotes, the kinds of things that they told us. Um, in one of the consultations, we, we were working with practitioners, and here they were actually building the bridge. So we gave them as a task to build the bridge, and some groups literally built a bridge like in the picture as you can see so they were they are trying to put like the building blocks where they thought was important to make research really impactful for their work um for uh, children for instance here they were saying also like uh, whether it is a politician or even just a parent or whoever when they talk about the internet they will normally only be talking about the negative parts and yes there are negative parts but if you want to inform people you should include both the positive, the benefits, the negative side. So we also thought about, we, we should also concentrate on the topics that we choose for the toolkit should also reflect this balance. Or some policy advisors were telling us things like put more energy in, in interpreting research, not only doing research, make it available. Evidence alone is not enough. Uh, they were very vocal about like the fact that, yeah, we are not, where, where do policymakers get their information? It's not that much in reading research papers but in gathering networks of researchers, we connect. So we need information in a different form and we are not gonna go and read the latest research paper because basically we don't have time. We want to be informed, but this is not the way we can be informed. So this is just another example of kinds of the things we did after consulting with them, we developed co-creation sessions in the second year where we asked participants to brainstorm in groups um, the, we um, invited a, a student uh, designer also to work with them, and they had to come up in three hours workshops with a prototype of uh, their ideal toolkit. So here you see some examples of things that they, they, the task was mainly describe what are the objectives of your toolkit, what would be your target group, and what would be the main functionalities. And um, these are some examples, some screenshots here. We, we had to do online sessions, unfortunately, but actually they worked quite well. We worked with Miro and OnSpot, they end up developing this type of prototypes. And here it's interesting to see, for instance, the case of adolescents. If you see, they focused a lot on sharing experiences, a lot of interaction. So for them, it was super important to have forum questions from people, personal experiences, create interaction within the toolkit. So it was super interesting to see that they really want to do things and interactivity was very important for adolescents. The prototypes created for teachers were quite different. And of course they focus on what they, they, they need. And like every day they teach. So they, they, they said, for instance, yeah, the topic of online safety, um, digital technology is so transversal that it should also be discussed in sports class. So for instance, maybe you could discuss issues like peer pressure, but then make it in such a way, link it to the curriculum, link it and show teachers exactly where they can use information. So for instance, if it's about propaganda, digital literacy, you can already, they say, present information differently. I mean, you are interested in history and then link the online part. So that was very interesting to see that they were like more interested in what they do already in class. So reading skills was important. And then they said you can place underneath the topics that could be relevant for those skills. So for sports, for instance, be a pressure for or well-being and well-being, digital well-being. So these were super interesting yeah, ideas that, that the teacher said, I'm not going to be looking for bullying necessarily, but if you put bullying under what I already do in my class, then I could relate to that. 
And in the case of policymakers, it was interesting to see you already see visually a very different format. You already see like graphs, the need for them to have information by country. They said, yeah, the, the, all, all the research is interesting, but to me, what would it speak to me would be something like um, putting the information from my country in a bigger context, understanding how good or how bad is my country doing in terms of cyberbullying in, in, in a European context, or understand like what kind of resources um, uh, are about policy, are not necessarily about um, uh, research, but of course, the research is important to inform the policy. So that was also very interesting to see that in, in even the, the prototypes they developed that we, we already saw this difference. So in general, we try to engage with our stakeholders in different ways, not only through the consultations, the workshops, workshops but we also ask them to um, give us their own recommendations. So we, our toolkit will include recommendations from the core project, but it will mainly include recommendations from our stakeholders, because um, we also thought there are many resources about digital technologies out there. There are plenty of super good lesson plans. There are a lot of platforms with a lot of content. So we thought we don't need to reinvent the wheel and that's not what our toolkit should be about. So uh, we asked them to uh, give us their contribution. We thought a teacher who finds something useful uh, can probably be a very useful resource for another teacher. So. We um, ask them, we also ask academics to contribute and, and to also provide an explanation of why they found something interesting. So then when you get some of the resources, for instance, uh, as an academic, you could potentially also see like, ah, okay, this resource is interesting, but, but why? Because for instance, in this case, it was a resource um, developed to um, teach about privacy and data protection. It will show participants the actual impact of their participation. And here, the researcher who shared this with us was telling us, yeah, I think researchers should also practice what they preach. We constantly make recommendations on how businesses <laughs> developing new tech and services need to be more transparent and offer trust-friendly information, but researchers could also contribute to this. And I think that, yeah, that's very powerful, but that's the kind of resources that we want to bring in the toolkit. So not just a resource, but also yeah, this is what I recommend, and, and I'm, I'm thankful because some people already in the panel have, they have basically all sent us also their recommendations, and, and it's super nice to, I think, for other researchers to see recommendations like this, and not just like, this is a list of resources you can find. So, yeah, finally, the, the main, um, I think that the, the key lessons learned that building the bridge is not easy and it's not easy at all. I think we underestimated the task. We thought it, it was going to be easy. And I think in our heads, we thought it was going to need less bridges, <laughs> like less building blocks. And in the end, it's becoming that, whoa, it's quite more. But reflecting together helps. I mean, talking to each other and having opportunities to see what, what they like, what they need. Because for instance, what we saw, um, it's very important to make your research accessible and find ways to make it accessible. We saw, for instance, for teachers that they want resources that are connected to curriculum uh, from NGOs that you need. They need, for instance, the research can be useful for them to fund, um, uh, to apply for grants, for funding opportunities, uh, for policymakers. Yeah, they, they need to inform the policy decisions. And for the children themselves, even if they are not going to be using uh, directly these, but they are going to be the beneficiaries in the end. I mean, if people, if teachers and if educators are learning more about research, latest evidence, yeah, of course, that's going to have a positive impact on children. But children, we also invited them because in the end, it's going to be about them. So they, they also said that they wanted to feel heard and recognized. And that also resonates with what Athena just said, that some kids feel voiceless. And here it was exactly the same finding that we want our voices to be heard. We want to shout out things. And if you develop something that is gonna impact us, we also want to be part of the process. So it's not because there's your, it, the kids are not your target group. If it's about children, you should involve them. If it's research about the elderly, but you are not targeting the elderly, uh, but they are gonna be the beneficiaries, you should include them. I mean, that, that, I think that's a key lesson learned. Um, the relevance of the resources, um, the targeting wilder information, so um, using different formats, different ways of layering the information, uh, and offer definitely more than content, but, but surely enough, keep 
the interaction going on and make sure that you give enough opportunities for the users to, yeah, to, to provide you feedback. So what's next? We will produce the toolkit and that's what we end up the concept of the toolkit. And as I said before, it's not gonna concentrate on providing again resources about online safety. It's rather actually trying to engage our stakeholders to use research. So teaching them like what is research in this area about? Uh, what are the key areas of interest in this area? Why do you need to use research? I mean, why would you like to use research and how you can use it? And where can you find good research and what are our recommendations? And finally, the guidelines for the academic community works a bit the other way around. It's uh, giving tips to academics to and, and also persuade them to engage more with their stakeholders and giving them concrete tips and good practice examples like the one I showed before and the ones that my colleagues have been sending me about yeah, good practices to engage with stakeholders. So yeah, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. Uh, and now our third presenter is um, Elizabeth Milovidov uh, from the Lego Group. Uh, hello, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the Global Digital Child Safety Lead, supporting the Lego Group as a trusted leader in implementing and promoting digital uh, ch uh, child rights, safety and well-being. And she is also uh, responsible for the digital engagement with children. Um, she is a lawyer, um, and um, as in this area of law and the child online protection, uh, she has worked for more than twenty years, uh, and she has advised governments, uh, governments, and child protection agencies, non-profit and think tanks on public awareness campaigns research initiatives and public policy strategies related to child to digital safety parenting and well-being um, elizabeth is also held several uh, uh, key consultancies in europe for the Council of Europe uh, for the Microsoft EMEA for uh, European Schoolnet and others, and uh, she found she has still time to um, to uh, feed her uh, website uh, of resources for parents and caregivers called Digital Parenting Coach dot com and that we can find so um please elizabeth the screen is yours and share with us your view from the from a different perspective great thank you oh my goodness it's so funny that introduction um and yes i i had the pleasure of working where veronica is now at european school net and also um being on the international advisory uh, committee for um athena's project for digigen so it's just so lovely to to see colleagues and friends uh in this space and talking about you know uh, the same things because we all love this stuff so i am going to tell you what's happening at the lego group but really the best part um is that I'm already hearing uh, some of these same things, right? So what you've heard about, you know, um, the the age uh, of who should be, let me just swap screens, of course, um, the age of who should be there, um, you know, because we're creating things for those people, right? And so we really do take that approach as, as well. So of course, at the Lego group, and I know that you're thinking, ah, it's the brick, it's the brick. Uh, yes, it is the brick, uh, 90 years of brick and physical products, but it's also very true that we do have digital services and, and products. Uh, and so that's what I get to work on, uh, some of those digital uh, services and products and making sure that we uh, bring children in and families. And so what I thought I would do um, is just share pretty quickly um, about the right tech project. Project and, and give you an actual tangible uh, example of what we do uh, when we try to engage children and families um, in research. So the Right Tech Project, this is the Responsible Innovation and Technology for Children. Uh, and this is a project that's with UNICEF. Uh, we've partnered with them and it's co-funded by the Lego Foundation. So uh, it's really exciting. We have lots of different partners. I'll, I'll mention some of those uh, as well, but I would encourage
encourage you all to um, take a look at the website to download this report because I will just obviously give you a teaser to get you excited about it, uh, but you'll really be able to dig in and see some of the, the findings, the methods, uh, the insights, of course, and, and hopefully some learnings to help you in, in your uh, research. So what is Right Tech? Well, as I said, Responsible Innovation for Technology uh, in Children, and it's a three-year project. And so what's really cool is that it is, um, uh, it is um, with the Joan uh, Gans Cooney Center and also uh, other um, academics and other organizations, because we're really trying to, to bring in as many stakeholders and partners that we can, because we have this vision where we want to um, co-create with children and we want to co-create a model of digital innovation um, that is designed to promote well-being outcomes. So just imagine what we're trying to do is when we talk about children uh, sitting on, on screens, having a digital play experience, being digitally engaged, just imagine if when they got off the screen or even during that they were able to talk about digital well-being. They were able to, to say that they feel good. Uh, so this is really what we're looking for, some of these positive aspect influences of what technology can do. And this is really putting a, a spin uh, because we, we don't want to talk about the negatives. We really want to look at the, at the positives. So we're trying to develop practical tools um, that we will build that with businesses and governments. And so that way everybody can understand what we mean uh, when we say well-being in a digital age. So let me give you just another little example, give you some background. So here is the actual project. Um, and so, you know, split up into four phases. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I just want you to see, and on the right-hand side, you can see all of the uh, cool academics and uh, other organizations that we're partnering with. So we've already gone through phase one where they, um, tried to create, co-create, again, I wanna stress that, evidence-based child-centric well-being framework for children that's related to digital technology. And I'll tell you how we did that in a moment because I think that's probably what you're going to be, this phase one and phase two is where you're probably gonna be the most interested in. Um, so investigating using the mixed method research, the relationship between digital play design and children's well-being outcomes. So here, the, the this is still going ongoing and they're actually playing with children, playing with children and families and, and getting their insights. They're also letting them choose the games uh, that they want to play so we can really get their, their input. Um, phase three, this is a part where I will really step in uh, as global digital child safety lead. And this is where um, we, we have the framework, but we're going to embed it into the Lego group, into our own digital products and services. And then of course, afterwards, when we hope that it works as as well as we're thinking, we're going to disseminate the, the insights, the tools, because we want other people to be able to, to do the same thing in order to create systemic change uh, in the design and governance of digital technology for children. So again, I wanted to just show you um, a couple of slides that dig into what I'm talking about, only because I know that you're academics and you love this kind of stuff. <laughs> so do I. Um, but as you can see, so the project is underpinned by a series of principles. And, and here you can see child-centric, right? And again, I think uh, Veronica said it as well, you know, that you're really focusing on, on the, the group that you are community, that you are creating for. So here we prioritize co-creation um, and we want to be led by their understandings, not us. This is not the Lego group or sitting here saying, well, this is how we're going to do, you know, learning through play, digital play. No, we are really trying to understand their, uh, how they play. We've also tried to get an international um, um, approach, looking at different countries, trying to be as, as representative as possible. And, um, data-driven always, right? Uh, we want those uh, findings and assertions that are evidence-led, open and transparent. I know I'm just preaching to the choir here that you all understand these things, especially the collaborative approach and something that is aspirational. And I think that's huge when you're hearing from a company like the, the Lego Group, uh, it just industry player in general, that it truly believes in the potential of digital technology to have a positive impact uh, on children's well-being. I mean, this is, this is like the key thing. We really truly believe this and so now we're trying to 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 make sure find that that proof of concept if you will so um another just slide just to you know 
give you a little bit more details. So in that that phase, phase that first phase that I mentioned, they really looked um, at 34,000 children between the ages of nine to 17 from 30 different countries. And then as they got into this the play portion, that, that phase two, there were in-depth uh, workshops with over 300 children in 13 countries. And I wanna make sure to show you, I hope I included that slide, maybe I didn't, I hope I did, but uh, the one that shows the, the different countries, I don't think I did, but that's okay. I, I can tell you which countries. Um, but it's just really exciting uh, as well that they did scoping interviews with the parents uh, in these countries and really trying to, to understand overall, again, this whole idea of well-being. Um, so this is what the actual framework looks like, what the well-being framework looks like. This is what we came up with in, uh, again, that first phase where they did the literature review. And this is what we're actually testing right now with the children in phase two. So it's really exciting because as you can see, um, you know, number one is competence. And then you just go all the way around emotional regulation. I mean, how many of you who have children uh, or, or understand about this emotional regulation when they're playing on the device and you're trying to, you know, keep them in check uh, and let them be fully immersed and enjoy, but also understand when it's time to, to shut down. Uh, empowerment, social connection. We find social connection to be so huge because of course children want to, to play with their peers. They want to talk with each other. Uh, at the Lego group, we also have things like Lego life where they can share their creations. They can be proud of things. Um, and again, trying to under underline that creativity aspect of course, safety and security, we, we know that, right? Um, uh, again, preaching to the choir. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am always the one at the table saying, and did you think about that? And did you think about this person and, and these different groups? Because really, we want this to be accessible for all children, not just, uh, you know, a certain uh, type of child. Uh, and then self-actualization, of course, we really want children to have that sense of, of purpose. So again, what's really exciting right now is that they are actually um, doing these co-created uh, workshops with the children, trying to dig in deeply, and we will see what's going on. But before I uh, just end really quickly, I just want to share, you know, why is the Lego group even prioritizing this? And it's obviously because, um, you know, our vice president, uh, Anna Rafferty, she, she's also on the Digital Futures Commission with Sonia Livingston. Um, you know, we really believe that, that digital play is, um, holds tremendous potential and uh, to enrich children's lives. And so I think that is something that is absolutely key uh, to believe to understand that right tech is grounded uh, in the beliefs that children's lives will, will just become more and more linked to the digital. So another thing that I just wanted to show you and give you kind of a sneak peek as to something that's launching actually this week. So shh, I'm really showing you some of my work here. The, this is the digital child rights uh, and well-being principles of the Lego group. And so if you see on the bottom that digital well-being piece, that is um, the the basis of the Right Tech project that is looking at all of those things about competence and connection and creativity. And we're really trying to launch these principles across the entire group. So whether you're in a Lego store, retail store, whether you're a Lego designer, whether you're a vice president, that you're thinking of all five of these uh, principles uh, when we are thinking about what we do for children. So some of our key takeaways um, is that just with this research so far, you know, I, I don't know if I should even say their takeaways as more as questions and even future considerations, but you know, what do we understand uh, by children's well-being in a digital era? What does that truly mean? How can we understand this relationship between the design choices, um, especially the design choices that we're making? And I'm sure you've heard that we're, we're doing a project with uh, Epic Games right now. Um, how can we begin to optimize for children's well-being uh, through play-based design choices? And how can we just position this well-being and play at the center of a model of positive digital innovation? So these are again, the takeaways, the things that we were already able to, to kind of tease out from the work that we've done so far. And of course, they are also questions for future consideration. If you have any questions, if you have any suggestions and answers, please send them to me. I would be happy to, to uh, incorporate them. Um, and again, as we all know, we have a responsibility to make digital play safe, inspiring, and beneficial for all. So thank you so much for letting me share. I hope that was fast enough. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and uh, so interesting. So, for the notes and the comments and the overview about these so uh, stimulant um, um, contributions, I give the floor to Big Zaman. Big Zaman is professor in communication sciences and human computer interaction, also at Catholic University of Leuven in, um, Leuven in Belgium. 
Her research interests include interaction, design, and children media convergence and progressive research and dissemination methods. She is the research group leader of the Meaningful Interactions at the Institute of Media Studies, also from the in the Catholic University of Leuven. And um, she is very uh, interested in these issues of uh, science communication. And this is why we invited uh, Bic to make some comments and some provocations and some questions to our to our speakers. And uh, um, I am very happy to see this, um, this um, panel taking form at this moment. And so Bic, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. And first of all, also thank you to the speakers. So um, I've listened to your presentations with lots of interest. And um, before I, I have a question for you, and I will also double check how much time we have, I would like to kind of wrap up a few things that I've seen and, and heard in your presentations. And I, first of all, for the three presenters, I want to congratulate you for being pioneers and sharing your best practices, your lessons learned, because uh, what you did is, is, is great in the sense that you have been sharing with us your roots, your uh, itinerary in looking for more child-centric participatory approaches, participation from various stakeholders, not only limited to children, adolescents, youth, but also other stakeholders, um, including, for instance, educators. I think you're also pioneers in um, the genuine interest and efforts you invested in building bridges by doing so on uh, an international scale, of course, uh, to the extent that the project allowed, but you're all tapping into a broad network, which is interesting because then we can see how things work. We also had the chance here today to look a bit behind the scenes because sometimes we might say we're doing participatory work, but then people might wonder, how do you do it? So that's what I liked about today. We you shared the processes that often um, are not shared. People tend to focus on outcomes very, um, very often, but here we, we got to know about the process. And all of this is was driven not only from um the motivation to share knowledge but also to facilitate and be a catalysator for positive change so even the uptake of these findings making a difference in uh, the lives of these stakeholders so congratulations for those elements um i know that normally we end in two minutes um so um what I will do, I will ask one question to all of you, which is kind of an uncompassing, and then we see how far we got, and then you are the timekeeper, uh, Christina. Um, but what I noticed is that sometimes it might be hard to tell what we're doing, <laughs> because from the moment you try to be participatory in your efforts, uh, from the moment you do research, you can already do and, and pursue a co creation process, a co-research process, just like uh, Atina and Elisabeth shared. But we can continue this and also think of the dissemination also in a participatory way. And this is what Ver Veronica emphasized in her project. So it's sometimes it's blending because if you do the research and you involve them in an early stage, you're already conveying like preliminary findings, if you do involve them at the end of the project, when you really have your final results, and uh, like Veronica shared, you do then share these findings. Well, because you enter into a dialogue, you might get new insights as well, some new lift examples, which maybe help you to refine your findings. So where does it end? <laughs> or where is the beginning? Where is the research? Where is the dissemination? Where does it begin? Where does it end? How? How long should we go? What are the best practices? What are your um, um, yeah, experiences with that? Recommendations also to explain to other people what you're doing. Is it still research? Is it dissemination? So I think it taps into the three of you as an encompassing question. It does have sub facets, so feel free to pick out what you feel is relevant. That was a big question. Wait, what? <laughs> Can you say it again? <laughs> well, um, the, the question part. <laughs> the, the question is, 
we have been seeing in the presentations participatory research, but also participatory dissemination. But where does one begin? Where does one end? And how how to communicate about it? What you're doing? Okay, that's a huge question. I'm gonna. It's a great question. I'm gonna jump on it really quickly because I I think I have an idea, um, and that is it's always a flow. It's always a flow for us because even as we're doing things right now um, with the, the phase one that led into phase two and we're doing the workshops, we also try to share back some of these findings, but we don't want to uh, um, change the results as you will, or kind of bias things, but it's still exciting to let the, um, the participants know where we're going. Um, but I think what's another thing that's really interesting is even with a different group. So for example, with the principles that I just showed you, uh, yesterday I did a, uh, a webinar with the Microsoft Council for Digital Good Europe, those teens, sharing the principles, getting their feedback, uh, getting their ideas. The, the mural board is still open so they can just add in whatever they want. Um, and then I'll feed it back. I'll feed it into our pro project and I'll try to feed it back into, into theirs. So for me, like I said, I feel like it's this, you know, they once said that, you know, trying to get information um, from the internet is like drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, and I do feel that sometimes all of this information and child participation and dissemination, that it's just a fire hose of, of, of stuff, but I think it needs to be shared. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, but even in your explanation, Elizabeth, it, I noticed you said like, on the one hand, we do share the findings and then we don't want to change the results. But then the minute later or a second later, you said, we do welcome their feedback. So we do listen and it might affect our results eventually. Yes, but on two different things, actually, because one's the principles and the other is actually the research uh, of, of what we're doing. So yes, maybe you caught me out. Maybe it's both. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah, my question is sometimes if you really start probing and, and diving deeper in, into it, you feel it's it seems all blending at one point. And so we're cutting it's, the boundaries. Thanks for world. sharing your... You're um, what about the other uh, speakers, Veronica or Altina? Yeah, well, uh, I think we, we not only in the core project, but in other projects um, I've been working on, I think... Um, we are trying to bring participation on different stages of the project. So all over the project, um, we started in core engaging them at the, be at the beginning I and mean, to understand what they need, but we keep on engaging with them through the whole process because uh, I think that uh, if you just engage them at the beginning, a project in a academia is <laughs> rather slow, it lasts three years. And if we are researching digital technologies, I mean, things evolve. I mean, in three years, lots, happens and certainly when we are talking about opportunities and, and potential online risks and things like this so you cannot but to keep engaging them i think that at some point though when i think it's important to engage them on different stages i think one you engage with them when you do the research so you, you need to understand what they need what they want and how you can try to bring that into your own research um, but also um, as a researcher, then I think you, you at least need to think about two different target groups when you disseminate. One, from my perspective, are the people you who work with you in the research. So if you consulted children, if you consulted teachers, you need to go back to them. I mean, we have a responsibility to inform them and inform them in a different way. And that information process doesn't need to be top down. I mean, when you go back to a school and say, look, this is what we learned from the data we gathered from you guys, uh, what did you think about it? And I think in, in one of the projects we are working on together with Christina, with, uh, with Pika, we are actually in that process right now with some of the partners in that other project. And we are actually thinking about how, what is the best way to bring impact to our research by going back to the, the people mm -hmm. who helped us Mm -hmm. in collecting this data. And at that stage, yeah, some of the results might be reshaped because for instance, even when you you want to discuss the, ask them for ideas, I mean, what, what are the more relevant findings for you? Or what are the more, uh, what would be the, a nice format for you to have? Even at that moment, they may come up with, with different ideas or with different insights on the same findings. Uh, and I don't think then you, your research should stop there. I mean, the, you can be transparent in research and say, well, this is what we gather and that's what happened. But actually, I think we could also have recommendations like, and, and well, and when we went back to them, 
uh, some things changed. And, and I think that, mm -hmm. that, that the transparency, the capacity to reflect and to keep on learning as a researcher is something that we shouldn't underestimate. And we shouldn't just stick to the uh, reflecting on the data we collected two years ago. I think like if you go back to researchers, I think as researchers, we need to start thinking about new ways of integrating the possibility that your research mm -hmm. might change. But I think that in, in the past, we weren't used to bringing researchers back to our subjects and to see how they feel, how they react to our researches. And I think now it's important that we start reflecting on you know, what is going to be the impact of that when we go back to them. So I, I think it's a great question. And then, then the last part is that it doesn't stop there. Dissemination and impact shouldn't mm -hmm. stop there. I mean, then we have a responsibility to bring our results to many more people. I mean, it's about children. I mean, who, I mean, children live in an ecosystem like so complex. We, would love to have parents informed, not by the, the news or what they find on Facebook, but actually by what research tell them. But we then need to work a lot on, on outreach. And so how do we make our research impactful for the people who can have an impact and improve the digital lives of, of young people? And those will be parents, those will be friends, those will be also the parents of your children's friends, because our friends don't just yeah. play at yeah. home. So, so yeah, I think thanks for bringing in these yeah. nuances on stakeholder groups and the temporality and the ambitious outcomes. I do. I might have a follow up question, but I first want to hear what Athena thinks. Well, uh, I think for me, uh, two things are important. One is uh, within ethical protocols, of course, do not be afraid to experiment in both how you're core researching and how you disseminate and creating these flows and loops that uh, that uh, Elizabeth and Veronica are talking about. So that's very important to experiment in research because otherwise, why are we doing it if we're not kind of using new methods, new tools, both to research and to implement and to um, disseminate and, and create a dialogue and a dialectic with the society that is funding this research, right? Now, the second thing, having said that, is that uh, unfortunately, the way research is done at the moment um, uh, is within a neoliberal logic, right? So this means that unless you have budgeted these uh, feedback flows inside projects, then it is very difficult to go afterwards and demand of people to work for mm -hmm. you to, to mm -hmm. do this kind of work. So I think there is a restrictive element to this. Uh, however passionate or unease, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. such as Elizabeth and Veronica, unfortunately, uh, this has to be factored in. Otherwise, you won't have it, right? Mm -hmm. That That is uh, important to say as well, that you have to design this. Uh, on a basis, mm -hmm. get it funded, and so on and so forth. It cannot be like an afterthought. So these are my two um, kind of contributions. And um, and like last thing to say is that it is fantastic to have uh, industry players, uh, of course, funded projects. Uh, I think uh, besides sort of uh, more commission funded or whatever funded, uh, and this is a, a great and a good thing. Uh, for me, it's just thinking through um, at what level does that funder intervene in in the in the project in in the research if they intervene in what way? Because this is something that also it needs to be accounted for, uh, especially when we're doing academic research. In particular, that is tends to be publicly funded. So if you include other actors we have in that research corporate or, or consultants, uh, policy people, uh, you know, NGOs that do this kind of um, revolving door kind of stuff from one project to the next. For instance, we have to know what is the, the impact this collaboration has on the academic research project as well, and how it is then disseminated and influences mm -hmm. to collaborate. So there's a, there's a, I think a caution there to be thinking about, about the sort of, let's say more political economy questions that we, we specialize here at the University of Leicester. <laughs> okay, thanks for bringing in, pointing to the, the reality of having to work with the resources that we have <laughs> to think about ethical uh, elements and also impact, which, may, which makes me also wonder how to measure impact and what are useful metrics um, to make sense of uh, impacts. Okay, Christina. 
what is the timekeeper you're muted so um yes yes we expected um to have one hour uh i'm very happy but if you have some uh another question big and if uh, uh, the others agree we can um go to a second round of questions and uh, finish in five minutes do you think it's okay because i one great thing that these uh, webinars provide is memories. We have here the opportunity to discuss this topic, and we will write a post for the for the blog of the white skills. So there will there will be a memory of this discussion and of these uh, different contributions. They will be uh, available in the white um, skills channel. So this is um, an opportunity to provide also food for thought. So um, Bic, if you have, if you want to put um, a second question and the others agree, we can finish after the second round. Okay, I will ask uh, again an encompassing question in the hope that one, two, or all of them uh, can address it. But please pick out one sub element so that we uh, don't take another hour. Um, well, each of you has um, experience with a more participatory way of working with the stakeholders. And um, we can think of getting the in uh, or engaging with stakeholders also to shape the way we share our findings. But we can get feedback on form, for instance, in which form should it be? Like we heard things like uh, a toolkit, like Atina and Veronica were talking about toolkits, but I also saw something like a poster, but we can get also to the participation and engagement on the findings itself. And then we can even think about the actionable advice. So we, there is one thing to know what we found in research, but the other thing is, what do we do with it? How can it shape future people? And in, on each of these levels, we can involve feedback from people. So do you have best practices on that? For instance, do you have best practices how to think of the form? Which forms are relevant? Are there other forms and the toolkits? Or do you have best practices with respect to how to formulate actionable advice, recommendations for other people and engage people in that process. Anyone? <laughs> mm, best. Maybe, yeah, from, yeah. From, from the core project, I think from the co-design sessions, we could see we were yeah, I'm already asking people about a toolkit, but I think the elements that came out, I think, are, are, are more most interesting. I don't think the shape might change depending on, on the target group, but aspects such as providing interaction, possibilities for, for feedback, which are very expensive to implement, and then you need people like, for instance, behind the platform to do that. But I thought those were things that were, were interesting, even on, on, a, on a smaller scale that you could think about. Um, yeah, how, how just if I go back to a school, maybe I don't just come with a PowerPoint, but then I should do some activities with the people because I thought like young people like to engage and do things. So I think more than, than the format, it would also be depending on who you're working with. I mean, you, if you think about schools, they're so diverse. You can go to a school with lots of resources and you might go to a school, to a school in some part of the world who might not even have a screen. So I, I also think it's also very, very important to to consider yeah, the diversity you targeted and, and not just bringing results back to schools, to students. Because if you're looking for different for diversity, for instance, you might come up and you need to bring your own results in, in different ways and in different formats, depending mm -hmm. on who you work with. And if you went to school, for instance, that, that in a very in a, in a, in a, mm -hmm. um, social economically deprived area, you might need to bring your results differently. So I think for me, mm -hmm. more that, that, than the kids that you really, as researcher, like have a very humble attitude mm -hmm. that, that, that when you consider going back, that you don't think that, well, I'm going to go back with the results. How yeah. am I going to speak to them? And, and how are they going to listen to me? And that will mm -hmm. change. So for me, it's more like the attitude of really understanding your audience and feeling them. I think yeah. that... Th that, that was also something that I noticed in the yeah. three presentations. You all started in one way or the other by addressing 
for whom it is it relevant, for who are who are we doing it? Uh, so in each of your presentation, that was an important building block. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking um, maybe Elizabeth, if we want to reach out to industry, it was also one of the stakeholders mentioned in one of the presentation. How should we convey our findings? Yeah, yeah, actually, I think I was, I was going to go back to your, to your original question anyway, but I was going to answer it without my Lego hat on. I was going to answer it as uh, someone who's been a consultant in this space for a, a while. One okay. of the things that I've always found is that you... Um, you take your people where you find them, right? So that means you have to see who they are, what the culture is, um, what do they understand best? Um, because again, just because we we have found this this key, we need to understand how will they what how can we deliver it to them in a way that's going to resonate? And sometimes that means asking them, you know, how do you how do you want us to feedback or or what what works best in your community? I'm sorry, you're hearing my puppies run around behind me. It's not me snorting. Um, so so it's just I think that that is something that's really key because as soon as I hear toolkit, I have to admit I my it kind of reflexively go ah not another toolkit. Um, but it also it depends on what you know. Something that I saw in the DigiGen project, for example, was that it wasn't a, a toolkit. There were cards, actionable conversation, and then they made it not only just card. Uh, deck, but also something that you could do online. So, you know, therefore, we're not really forgetting a whole group of, of people uh, who don't have necessarily have access. So I, I, I really think that you have to, 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 you know, find a way to not make this be just about reach, but to make it be about engagement. That is what you're really mm -hmm. looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and then as to your point about industry, um, all I can talk to is for myself. I'm available. I put my information in the chat. I would love to have any of your uh, insights, especially any, anyone who has a measurement on a digital well-being KPI. I would love it. I would take it. It's just like a sponge and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but I think that, you know, you, you can't be afraid. And I think you also have to use your networks like CORE, like um, European School Net, like, you know, the DigiGen network of, of, of academics. Um, use those, uh, use those, those networks to, to, to share and because really we want this information, but it has to get to, it has to get to industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. What about you, Atina? Uh, so I think uh, what I, I have found uh, quite um, fascinating is how long um, it takes from producing academic research to then have the policy recommendations, to then have implementations, right? And and I think that this is this cycle is is, uh, is so are the like so difficult. And for government, for government specifically, because we because Elizabeth talked about uh, uh, the um, the industry, right? But for governments, I mean, these guys like they're still talking about media literacy and and you know. <laughs> we are like in data algorithmic literacy, like the whole thing has gone down a whole other road, right? And it takes ages um, for it to 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 kind of uh, get into the into the government policy, right? And there are from the engagement we had uh, on uh, Inner2, which was another project on um, uh, live streaming and mental youth for young people. When we had the youth panel that came. Uh, and the industry together in dialogue, uh, th these children, I mean, 15, 16, they were saying, we, we don't trust uh, the government basically anymore, uh, th that they're gonna look out for us in terms of misinformation, in terms of all this kind of stuff. Maybe it is not that the government doesn't want to do. I can see, for example, the online harms bill or other bills and, and you know, on disinformation and all sorts of things. The point is that the language that is used there and how they're trying to implement in schools or in other places is not in touch with how these young people talk or think and what they're doing. And some of the research results are about that. They don't understand why we mm -hmm. like or we have problems when we're online or what it is. And, and the language that they speak is so old-fashioned and, and how the mm -hmm. job implement in schools is, is uh, kind of out of touch as well, right? So I think this is a problem for the for the government side of things in any case. Okay, thank you for sharing that. It's another reason why we should co-create it so that we speak the language and so that it resonates better. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you also from my side. I'm so happy with this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm think I think that uh, it uh, uh, 
um, answer to the title, to the headline, to how to how to engage non-academics. We have discussed a lot, and um, as we said, we will um, write a post and um, make this uh, so rich discussion more uh, public, more available for those that are interested. And I'm sure that uh, uh, lessons learned will be taken from this uh, one hour that we have um, spent together. Thank you so much for, uh, for your participation. So, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, you Christina. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you.